without further ado, let me introduce this keynote speaker. He does not need much introduction. He has um, pretty much invented cron for Linux, uh, bind for DNS, <clears throat> and he is in the Internet Hall of Fame. I watched the talk when he was inducted into the Internet Hall of Fame. Uh, he said he is standing on the shoulders of giants just like Newton. And today, he is a giant. We are going to stand on his shoulders and s listen to what he has to talk about. So without further ado, let me invite Paul Wixie to the stage. Paul. Sorry. Work is viral. Uh, Oh, it's working. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, John, for those uh, kind remarks. I am uh, new to Amazon. Uh, the 28th next week will be my one-year anniversary, and I saw an opportunity here to share with you some of uh, sort of what was new to me, what was interesting to me about this company and this job. My job uh, is to be a vice president, distinguished engineer. I am in the AWS security team, so my remit is to worry about the AWS infrastructure, uh, find ways to either detect or prevent attacks against it, and generally serve the customers with uh, more predictability and more uptime. Um, so, I came here without ever having been an Amazon customer. I mean, I'm sure that I have bought a lot of stuff on our website, but in terms of AWS, yeah, I knew there was a cloud. Um, but, you know, honest to God, during my interview process, what came up is that as far as I knew, Amazon was Earth's biggest bookstore. I didn't know what else they did. Um, so it's been quite a ride. And uh, some of you know that I have a background in open source software, uh, protocol development, uh, especially in DNS, IETF, and so forth, uh, and in security. I started the first anti-spam uh, company back in the mid-90s. We invented the RBL. Um, so these are just, you know, I've, I've been interested in everything. And the thing that stuck really is security because um, uh, those of you who have been around long enough will remember how much safer the world was and the people living in it and our property uh, before the internet, right? Once we connected everything to this common fabric, it turned out that everything was a little bit, you know, weak. Um, and those weaknesses can now be discovered by people who make no particular investment in locality. They don't have to be in the same room or the same city or the same country as you in order to find ways in which your uh, online information, uh, including possibly your credit card numbers or your email archives or your contact list, whatever, are accessible in ways that you didn't know, your supply chain didn't know, your vendor didn't know. Um, so, you know, as a longtime denizen of internet stuff, I thought uh, this was partly my fault. And so I'm currently looking for ways to restore human security to pre-internet levels. And uh, the idea of helping to secure the infrastructure that uh, supports a huge part of the world's e-commerce, uh, that's attractive to me. And so that, that, that's why this job, instead of something else that I may also have been qualified for. Um, so I want to talk about you know, a couple, of, a couple of things, and I will leave time if I possibly can uh, to, for a Q&A, and it may be that your Q&A is off topic from the point of view of this, uh, this talk, and that's fine. Um, we have moved from these traditional networks um, to this cloud thing, and we didn't have a blueprint, right? So uh, nobody was asking for a cloud when the first cloud appeared. Uh, it was just kind of a natural outgrowth of everything that had been done <clears throat> up till that point. Um, and so if you're gonna build something for scale, 
Uh, there's a lot that you will have to do differently, and unfortunately, there's an awful lot you don't have to do. Um, but again, this, there was no master plan. Uh, every year, the companies who are in this business and the individual technologists who are in this area uh, look at what's currently happening and what are the weaknesses and what are the opportunities, and then we zig or we zag according to whatever is now possible or whatever has just finally been proven vital. Um, and, you know, the, that sounds chaotic, and if you lived through it, you know it was a little bit chaotic. It's also the only way that it could have been done. Had there been a master plan, we would still be arguing about it instead of using it. Um, so, networking... Uh, in the traditional way, <clears throat> you know, without a cloud, without someone else to do it for you, uh, involves an awful lot of complexity. Uh, and that includes everything from knowing what you're doing, uh, fitting all of these disparate facts into your head, getting it written down in a way that it becomes corporate information instead of individual information, um, figuring out sort of in general what <clears throat> is gonna work and what headroom do you need, what's your budget, um, and then starting to test equipment or you know, buy off the rack and hope for the best. Um, there's a lot that goes on there that, you know, frankly, I love, but there are no people, no new people will be born uh, who love that stuff. Uh, so what we have to work on now is how do we make these capabilities available to people who don't want to spend their lives doing the things I just described? Sorry for the animation, but uh, first you build it, and then you connect it. And if you want to connect to you know, some arbitrary other party on the internet, uh, you and that other party will both have to somehow have a data path between you I can almost guarantee that it will never be a piece of fiber from you to them unless it's some other part of your company or your, in, your university uh, or your house. Uh, it's almost always going to go through this middle. Uh, getting to the middle and getting to the other side of that middle is one of the complexities that I think a lot of people would like to uh, avoid. Um, let me tell you why. So when you're building one of these, you're dealing with uh, the physical media, which could be a Cat5 cable, or it could be Wi-Fi, whatever, but you know, you, you have to have some way for your devices to connect to the network you're building. Um, and then you may, depending on how many rooms there are, or how many buildings there are uh, in a campus, you may have some bridges, some interior routers. You probably have firewalls, although you may not have turned it on. I recommend doing that. Um, and finally, you're going to have some kind of a gateway to an inter internet service provider who has the job of getting you to the other end for all values of other. Um, you can, and let's say this is now a business rather than home, uh, there are a couple ways that you can get your edge network that you want to have reachable to the rest of the internet uh, reachable. And you know, one would be, and this is old school stuff, uh, you could rent some space at an internet exchange. Um, special note to the Palo Alto Internet Exchange, not far from here, uh, which I began also in the early 90s. Um, and it was just a way for ISPs to all bring their equipment to the same building so that they could connect to each other so that they could then serve their customers. Uh, of course, that building had to have various you know, safety and security features, uh, but it also had to have an awful lot of fiber coming to it because if you connect your router to all of the other ISPs, but that router that is connected to them is not also connected to the rest of your network, then you're not, you're not doing the job. Uh, so anyway, yeah, you can rent space in an internet exchange. Uh, the one I started has been acquired by Equinix, which is uh, kind of the big kahuna in this space. Um, and then you can uh, extend your network to that space and speak the border gateway protocol by which you can advertise into your neighbors the reachability of your networks. And then depending on your relationship 
especially your business relationship with those BGP neighbors, they might further advertise the reachability of your networks to their neighbors and so forth. And that, that's it. It's uh, uh, the, the core of the internet really is just that simple and has to be because uh, every time somebody tries to add complexity to it, all hell breaks loose. So this tends to be as simple as possible, but it is a kind of expertise that most companies don't otherwise need to have. Um, and uh, I guess there's a, a rump uh, use case here where the way you connect to the internet is you build your own data center inside your own building or use the one that your IBM mainframe used to be in and somehow use fiber to the curb to uh, connect the data center you already had. That is shrinking fast. That space is far more useful for other purposes and very expensive to populate and utilize. Now, once you've done this, there are some security properties that come with it. If you do any of these things, um, then you also have to monitor it, uh, look for DDoSs. Some of those DDoSs may be coming from inside your network if you get infected with things. Um, and uh, you gotta be ready to take complaints uh, from people who say, hey, how come you've, you're DDoSing us or spamming us or whatever? Uh, and you have to change your network. Sometimes you have to suspend a customer until the next day when they can explain why these DDoS flows were coming from the connectivity that you were providing to them, uh, or maybe it's some other department or, or what have you. Um, and this is a 24-hour-a-day job. If you're not able to do it at that level, you'll be seen as not able to play at all, and people won't take you seriously. You won't get the benefit of the doubt. So it's worth avoiding all of this just for that last bullet point. It's, it's worth not building your own network, uh, either because the people you can hire don't know how to do that because it's no longer a, a current skill, or because the ancillary costs are so high that you have to avoid them. You just, you can't tolerate some of this stuff unless you're in a business that requires that tolerance, in which case it's in your budget. Now I come from a varied background and part of what I was involved in was the domain name system, DNS. And um, you know, DNS is the, the hidden jewel uh, and also the, the hidden hand grenade uh, in the internet architecture. It's, um, you know, there's a joke that goes around as you know, somebody says, uh, it, it, it's not DNS, it wasn't DNS, it can't be DNS, and then it was DNS. And they're just talking about, they had an incident, something wasn't reachable or something was, uh, something was wrong, and it you know, often turns out. Now, I wrote the middle version of bind. Bind version eight was, a, was my work, but I maintained bind version four after Berkeley kind of went out of the business, and um, I hired the people who did bind nine, and so I know that a lot of what makes, what gives DNS a bad name is that the software barely works, and um, it takes a long time for this stuff to mature, and now that bind version nine is 21 years old, uh, it is finally stable, it's finally safe. Uh, you can finally just sort of unspool it and install it and nothing bad is likely to make your pager go off. I guess it would be a cell phone today. Um, and so a lot of the bad name of DNS was really just, we didn't know what we were doing. We were writing it in C, which is a uh, manifestly memory unsafe language. Um, you know, on the other hand, if we hadn't done it, we may not have the internet in the form that we now know it and, uh, and, and live with it because nobody was gonna be, uh, I don't know, connecting to a web service uh, using IP addresses, especially IP version six addresses. And so these names, which had some kind of meaning, um, you know, amazon.com being an example, is what made the internet attractive to an audience and made it reachable. So the, the, the utility of the internet comes from a lot of sources, but the DNS is certainly one of the foundation stones of the utility function. Um, so every activity 
whether for good or for evil, uh, on the internet is preceded by one or more DNS transactions. That's how important it is. And so if you wanted to live like I do, where you don't trust anybody else to handle your DNS for you, uh, and you really wanted to just you know get your hands dirty, which frankly I recommend for your home lab, um, but again, you would have to be a company who wanted th to have this expertise before you would do as a company the things I'm about to tell you. Um, so first, you're gonna need to figure out what software you're gonna use. There will be a training cycle, there will be a test cycle, there will be test labs. Some of the testing will be for correctness, some will be for uh, what if we upgrade uh, one version but not the others. Some of the testing will be what if I DDoS it, how much can it tolerate, uh, what's the backscatter pattern of that DDoS. In other words, if I'm being attacked uh, but the attack is spoofed, then who am I gonna be hurting when I try to answer all the spoofed traffic? There's a lot of testing. And the testing may prove that some software is better than other software, uh, and you gotta be prepared for that. And again, for your home lab, let me just say I recommend this. Uh, it is a lot of fun. Uh, but if somebody in your company wants to do it, then you should grill them very carefully to find out if they just wanna have fun or if they've got a business case. The content, you know, if it's bind or something like that, it's gonna come from a text file. Uh, and, you know, this is where we get into a debate about VI versus Emacs. Uh, by the way, Emacs. Um, but uh, that's old school. There's plenty of open source and proprietary software that you can run DNS on that wants to get its content from a SQL database or a NoSQL database or something like that. Um, you may also find that you'd like to connect some software to this where the content is not stored and then retrieved, rather the content is generated at the time of the query. So there are plenty of little tiny DNS servers uh, whose job, if you ask it a certain question for a certain domain name and a certain record type, they'll tell you what time it is. Okay, well that's probably a stupid example but it's a very illuminative stupid example because you can imagine all the other things you could do in software if you didn't have to know what the answer was before you got the question. And that, for example, is how uh, CloudFront, which is the uh, content delivery network uh, in, inside of AWS, or Akamai, or a lot of other uh, content delivery networks, that's how they work. Uh, they don't have a database full of answers waiting for questions. What they have is software that is prepared to calculate and return an answer dynamically at the time they receive a query. Um, so you, you could be doing any of those things uh, or a combination of those things. But either way, you've got to uh, put your content into the form that it can be published by the software that you chose. And when you publish it, you will need redundant name servers. You can't just put one in one place and uh, hope for the best. Not that a lot of people don't do that, but you should ideally have them in different earthquake zones. In other words, one here in the, uh, on the Pacific plate and then another one somewhere else. Because earthquakes happen and power is lost and fibers are cut and so on. And it's not just earthquakes, that happens to be you know, the, what we normally talk about in California, but you could also say an atmospheric river took out my data center. You'd like to have another name server somewhere so that that does not become a crippling injury for you. Um, so finding a place to put the other servers and make sure that they are compatible with the software that you chose for serving your content becomes one of the things you have to do. Um, these days, because there's so much fake stuff on the internet, uh, disinformation happens not only at the human level where we are exhorted to vote for or against some thing for reasons that uh, have been targeted to make sense for, to us in, in individually, uh, there's also a lot of disinformation at the meta level. In other words, uh, returning somebody else's address hoping that you will cause millions of uh, end users to attack them um, yeah, you would need DNS to do that. And if you don't control the DNS name that is gonna be used as part of an attack like that, 
you have to find a way to get people to believe something that isn't true so that they will then take the next step of whatever is your evil purpose. Um, and we've developed a solution to this, and it's that solution is barely cheaper than just living with those problems, but it is cheaper, and I recommend if you haven't explored DNSSEC, you, you should do so. Um, and it's like any other modern crypto-based uh, system. You generate a key, you hand the public key to somebody so that your, your signatures can be validated, you sign your content, and then people who want to validate your content have a way to see the signatures you put on it, they see the key that you published, and they, they're able to detect that the wrong thing, uh, that the, what they're receiving is not your data, but rather the, the data belonging to some attacker. Um, this is far-fetched, right? This is not an attack we see every day, but it is the kind of thing where um, we don't want to live in a world where you, we are count, trusting our coffee shop to introduce us to our bank. Uh, the coffee shop may not be strong enough to make that introduction. So if our bank has signed their records, then it doesn't matter what the coffee shop returns to you, you'll be able to tell whether it really came from your bank or it didn't. So this is another thing you have to do if you're planning to do DNS yourself. So now we get to the special security related expenses of doing things this way. Um, signatures will expire. So whatever system you have for signing your data has to fire off an, an update to renew signatures before they expire. Normally, uh, you would give something an expiration period of 10 days and then re-sign that data in five days so that you had another five days to fix it if that re-signature process goes wrong. You probably don't want to think this way about your DNS content. You'd probably rather buy off the rack than to start with needle and thread to build this infrastructure. Uh, the content can also expire. Um, so if some other server that you're using to make yourself resilient against earthquakes and atmospheric rivers goes down, or it can no longer reach you, uh, you, need to, you need to know that before the data that it was holding expires, because if it's listed as one of your servers, people are going to be sending it queries. And if at some point it starts answering, hey, I, I don't have it anymore, I, I've got nothing, I couldn't refresh the content, so let me give you this failure message instead. So you need quite a bit of monitoring. Um, it's possible you'll be DDoSed, it's very likely that you'll be used as a DDoS amplifier. Um, if I, for example, wanted John to be off the network, I could send each person in this room a packet, a DNS question packet, claiming to be from John, and you would all answer him. And if I did that a thousand times a second, then I would have whatever, 100,000 per second hitting John. It's possible that John has a fat enough uh, internet connection that he could tolerate that and still get other work done. Possible, but unlikely. And it turns out the population of DNS servers that are willing to perform that type of amplified reflection is not in the hundreds, it is in the tens of millions. And so this is a common enough attack. You want to make sure that you're not participating in that attack or that if you are, somebody has to get out of bed and deal with it. So again, it is the human costs that will dominate the equation of trying to do this in the old way. And you know, I come from a DNS and open source background. I love this stuff. Um, most people are saner than me. Um, so, I, I share that with you so that you'll understand that um, the cloud had more purposes than we first knew, right? I'm, you know, the, and that's always true. If a tool is successful, you'll know about that success because it will get used in ways that the maker of the tool did not anticipate. That's sort of one of the success criteria for an artifact. Um, so, you know, there is a t-shirt that I have seen many times, uh, says the cloud is just somebody else's computer. Now in this room, I don't have to tell you, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, but kind of in the early days, that was the vision, right? There was all kinds of other stuff that had to be there besides just somebody else's computer, but it looked 
like somebody else's computer. In other words, the, for the earliest cloud services were uh, just VMs. I, I want to install thing, you know, whether it was Solaris or uh, early Linux or whatever, and I've got this VMware, and I've got some bit of virtualization software, and I'm just going to create sort of another you know, invisible phantom server, which will look, if you SSH to it, like a real computer, but it won't be. And that it was kind of all anybody knew when the first things called clouds were being created. So you could have a t-shirt in 1997 that said the cloud just looks like somebody else's computer, and that would be fair. It would not be fair now. Uh, you think about the hundreds of services that AWS has created for the benefit of our customers. Um, those were not visible. There was no way to have a vision that included all those things until we built the first part. And then once we built the first part, we discovered what the next bottleneck was or what the next opportunity was, next pain point, and then built more. And then, you know, based on that new incremental bit of progress, we built even more. So today, uh, the cloud is not like anything that came before. And um, I love it for that. It's, um, you know, it's very interesting as a security practitioner with some background in protocols and software uh, to be trying to secure this kind of thing. Because security, uh, real spy craft doesn't look anything like a James Bond movie. Um, and real security, yeah, it touches on the fancy stuff like crypto, um, but most of security is just understanding, um, which is why it concerns me greatly that we are trying to defend, not we at Amazon, but we as humanity are trying to defend our online assets um, in, from attackers who understand that infrastructure better than we do because it's their job to understand it or they can't attack it successfully, whereas our job is elsewhere, right? Security is a cost center. Attacks are a profit center. Guess which one gets more preparation? Um, so in terms of um, just real lived security, uh, it's gonna depend very much on how much of your infrastructure um, do you understand. And what the cloud kind of allows is to outsource some of that understanding. In the case of the networking that I told you about, nobody in the cloud has to think about that stuff except the provider of the cloud. And the DNS example I gave you is the same. But beyond that, there are some cool things that I have discovered in my first year at AWS Security uh, where you know, there, there's a kind, there are some things that you can do in the cloud that would be very hard to do, hard to, to motivate in a, in a private cloud. Not that you couldn't do them, everything is possible somewhere at some price, but um, these are some things that I have discovered in my short one year AWS journey that I thought I would share with you. Um, so one of them is the VPC, Virtual Private Cloud, and this is fairly old. This has been in existence for a dozen years or so. Um, and it means that you could have assets, and they might be servers, or they might be serverless lambdas, or S3 buckets, you know, whatever. Some set of assets uh, that you need from the cloud might be available over a fairly wide area. Uh, VPC allows you to kind of create your own private cloud using this, uh, this infrastructure. So it's not a private cloud where you're buying equipment and racking it up. It's a private cloud within an existing cloud. And, uh, you know, yeah, I've, I've heard that zero trust is coming and that we should all adopt the Beyond Corp model. Um, and there's probably a lot of truth in that. But while we do that, it's going to be necessary that some of our assets only be reachable by our own agents. And if you're gonna be doing that, then you're gonna need something like a virtual private cloud. Not that you couldn't simulate this by putting a host-based firewall on every server that was doing something for you, and access control lists uh, and, and so on, but 
if you do that, then any time you make a change, it's hugely expensive. And one of the things that the cloud is supposed to offer is the ability to get what you want without any single action that you take being the one that becomes hugely expensive. So um, VPC, I didn't know anything about it when I, when I came to AWS, uh, but it's cool. It is really cool. So uh, if you want some things to be reachable to other things, but uh, not universally reachable, that's doable. Uh, you can even say, look, I trust this set of actors inside my VPC, but not those. So we're just going to have the routing be that uh, the ones that need external access to the rest of the internet have it, and the ones that need internal access to the rest of the internal assets have it, but the default is there's no connectivity. That is very difficult to achieve if you don't have this. And so it becomes necessary whenever you're putting security into some plan that it, become, that it be practical. And sometimes the difference between doing it yourself versus getting it from a cloud provider is that it's the same security, but I would actually use it if it came from a cloud provider, but I will not use it if I got to do all that stuff myself, right? I was a very early adopter of Kerberos, um, and all of these things become practical, become usable in the cloud, whereas the cost of doing them yourself may be high enough that you decide on a weaker design just to avoid the, the deployment and operation costs, not to mention the uh, capital turnover and so forth. So, a um, little bit of motherhood and apple pie here. Um, we have invested, we, Amazon, AWS, have invested in a lot of places to put data centers of uh, kind of a known quality in terms of their power and their physical security and their networking and so forth, and we put them everywhere. And the reason for having a lot of availability zones is partly the earthquakes and uh, atmospheric rivers that I mentioned, but it's also often beneficial to have the assets your customers are accessing be close to those customers. Um, and if your customers are all in one place, then you know you, you probably don't need a lot of availability zones. But if your customers are global, you're gonna need to pick and choose and say, I need to be very low round trip time in these parts of the world, and you're gonna end up doing that. Um, in our cloud, you would do that by picking availability zones. Um, right? We often build things that nobody asked us for. I mean, S3 would be a prime example of that. Um, nobody was looking for cloud storage at the time that uh, we first released it. I say we, although I was not there at that time. Um, but we had a pretty good sense that if we build it, a lot of people are gonna like this, and boy, were we ever right. And we like being right. In fact, we have a leadership principle about being right. So um, some of these availability zones would have been driven by customer demand, but others would have been driven by ambition to serve customers better. And so um, a lot of what you see in terms of where we are uh, and, you know, sort of what, uh, what languages are spoke in the places that, uh, spoken in the places that we've moved to, um, that's, that's a huge part of who we are. Uh, we, we want to, uh, if, if I was Steve Jobs, I would say surprise and delight customers, um, but he's not here, so I, I will just say, we're very much driven by uh, what the customers, not just ours, but the customers of our partners and resellers, uh, are gonna be really happy that we did, even if they didn't necessarily have as much business intelligence as we did, and therefore they didn't know to ask for it, but they'll sure, sure as heck recognize it when, it when they see it. Now let me remind you that there's a difference between an availability zone, which is some set of data centers in some area, and a point of presence, uh, to be a point of presence means it's on our network and it is an internet exchange or something that acts like an internet exchange. It's a place where we exchange packets, uh, at, you know, using routers, speaking BGP, with other network operators. Um, 
And if we didn't have those 410 points of presence, it wouldn't matter how many availability zones we had because there'd be no way those availability zones could be reached. So this is, uh, I think, proof that Amazon understood the problem and has built a pretty well-targeted solution to that problem. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, nobody ever has a bad day, but on the whole, if you plug into this stuff and you roll some serverless, some containers, you roll some stuff into it, it's gonna work very well and you will have outsourced to us the job of understanding it. Um, and you know there can be some danger in that. I recommend understanding as much as you possibly have time to learn, uh, but you won't have to know it all the way you would if we weren't here. So let me talk about Nitro. Um, you know, if you build a large network uh, full of physical servers that is in turn full of virtual servers, and those virtual servers, you know, they could be part of the S3 offering, they could be part of some other offering, or they could be customer owned. Um, then what you'll have is kind of a huge inventory of virtual personalities. They have names, they have IP addresses, they have customers or internal teams attached to them. And then beyond that, you know, they're, they're running some operating system and we are emulating some kind of hardware so that that operating system will boot up and think that it is on a server, even though it's inside of a virtual server. Um, but you will have, uh, there will be some, some trouble from that. And I remember th thinking, one of the reasons that I was uh, shy about putting any of my company's information into a cloud was that the hypervisor could be attacked, right? The, the bit of software that is running on the real host that is creating the sort of virtual hosts for all these other operating systems uh, called guests um, was written in C at that time. It was Zen or... Uh, QEMU or KVM or whatever. Uh, and every once in a while, there'd be a way to break through where a guest that was supposed to be inside of a virtual machine could uh, gain control of the program counter of the real machine. And if you look at that as a risk and you say, well, if I'm sharing a bunch of physical servers with people who hate me and are trying to attack me, and they do this, they find a way to break through the, uh, the hypervisor level, what could they then do? What would I be exposed to? Okay, well, an early problem was uh, once you get control of the real server, then you could probably copy out the contents of memory from other virtual servers that are running on the same physical server that you just broke into. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know what kind of, of guarantee, this is five years ago, you know, when I was uh, still running a different company. I don't know how I could become sure that that wasn't possible. I don't know how I could get my confidence level up to the point where I'd say, hey, uh, this is safe, this is gonna be fine. Okay, well, the reason that I didn't know is because I didn't know about Nitro. So, um, these hypervisors that I've mentioned, Zen, KVM, and so forth, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're hugely in influential. They've helped create the market that we all now play in, but they're expensive. They burn a little bit of CPU time trying to pretend that you have a networking adapter. And you don't, right? You've got some virtual networking adapter. And these days, it's probably a uh, 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 hypervisor style thing where it's not a real network adapter and everybody knows it. But in the early days, you had to emulate a networking adapter that your guest operating system would recognize, which means you had to emulate something that was physical. You'd say, yeah, I am a 3COM, you know, 3C503 or, you know, whatever it was. Um, I'm an Intel gigabit ethernet chip or, or what have you. And then the guest would know how to transmit and receive packets. So um, that takes time. It takes, in particular, CPU time from a real CPU that's on your physical hardware. Um, and it also has some of the security weaknesses that I've identified where 
if somebody finds a way to break through uh, that driver, they might be receiving your packets in addition to uh, you receiving them. So what Nitro uh, is and has always been is some custom hardware that we put onto the motherboards of our servers uh, that offloads quite a bit of this. Right? For example, it offers a networking adapter that is, for all intents and purposes, a hardware device. It's just that there is software inside the Nitro environment that is uh, making it so. So it's still kind of a virtual adapter, it's just that it's not running in the context of the physical server CPU. And this in turn means that if you wanted to break into it, you'd have to break into the Nitro enclave rather than breaking into the, the, the host operating system. Uh, the Nitro Enclave is pretty hardened, but one of the best kinds of security you can have is simplicity, right? It's the list of things that you leave out and you find a way to solve in other ways so that you can drive down complexity to the point where somebody somewhere is capable of understanding the totality. Because otherwise you get this, uh, this weird uh, convolutional metric uh, where the, the, the threshold for understanding is always higher than the threshold of knowledge. Um, and this in turn means that the hypervisor is just about nothing. I mean, it's there, it's, uh, uh, it does some things, but it's not a Linux kernel or any other thing like that. It, it doesn't have a shell. Uh, it does only what the hardware needs it to be doing in order to context switch between different guests. And this in turn means that, let's say, I don't think it's, it would be easy to do this, but let's say that part of your threat model as a customer of all this is, well, what if somebody, I don't know, steals my account credentials and calls the AWS support people and says, you know, hey, I'm, I'm locked out of my machine, I need you to reset this or that, or I need you to do something for me. And they're able to successfully authenticate themselves to our call center because they stole your credentials and so forth, what, what's the worst that could happen in that case? Well, it turns out we can't get in either. There's nothing in the Nitro system that would let us as the cloud operator, let's say, copy out your memory um, and, uh, or get a shell or reset something or reinstall something. So uh, the idea here is to have it be if you want it to be secure, it also has to be secure against its own operator. And I thought that was impossible. I thought five years ago, I would have said, that's the reason that I can't put my sensitive bits into, into the cloud. Well, it turns out other people knew that I felt that way, even though they didn't talk to me directly, and they have solved this. Uh, so uh, 10 years ago, uh, Amazon bought a company called Annapurna Labs, and this is the business that they were in. And uh, so this is uh, present in most of our fleet and uh, highly recommended uh, to sort of uh, use this and you know, get your customers to use this because uh, it's the biggest single difference maker that you can have because if you have your own server in your own data center, then yeah, it, it's at risk. Somebody could somehow break into it from you know, Elbonia and uh, copy, copy out its physical memory. Uh, but other than that, you don't have any risk from your own hardware, right? The, 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 the modern risk from your own hardware. Um, but if you put that same thing in a cloud, before Nitro, you would have had to worry that it's gonna be subject to more kinds of attacks because it's no longer a physical server under my control. So Nitro is trying to restore uh, the security properties of something that really would be dedicated. Um, and it's just huge. Um, I, and there are plenty of YouTube videos on it. Now that I know to ask for it by name, I'm learning all kinds of stuff about it. But I will be uh, making some recommendations to that team that they find a way to get the message out to people who don't know about it and are not asking by name to see, you know, the various materials about it. Um, so there's a obligatory pictogram where we're trying to show you that the, um, the app is running on some kind of OS, the guest OS, uh, which 
because there's a hypervisor, that OS is going to see things like, I don't know, the real-time clock or the network adapter, the storage, and so on. Um, but that hypervisor is getting everything it needs from the Nitro hardware. Um, this is, uh, this is a, a new paradigm that the cloud, uh, the, the, the move of humanity and our systems to the cloud highlighted this um, and said, now that you got this far, let me show you what you need to do next. And uh, somebody listened. So pretty exciting. Firecracker um, is the second technology that I did not know about until I started working here. Um, and you know, the problem with serverless is uh, that it gives you sort of, uh, uh, you have to choose which bad thing you're going to accept. Uh, for example, if you can do everything you need inside Lambda, um, that's great. But if you can't and you have to port your app to be able to run inside Lambda, that's the cost. That'll become one of the costs of becoming serverless. Now, there are accompanying benefits because once you're serverless, then you don't have a kernel, you don't have device drivers, you don't, you know, you're probably still sharing some hardware somewhere, but it's a much higher level interface to that hardware. And so getting, breaking out of Lambda is hard. Um, and so if you can fit into Lambda, then it's great. You know, one of the things you won't have is Bash. Uh, and that turns out to be a good thing to not have if you can live without it. Uh, other shells also, but Bash is the famous one. Um, so that would lead you toward containers. And there are a lot of different container standards. I'm, I'm not going to mention any one by name. I'll just say that containers are fine. They're fine work because it's an immutable image. Uh, you generally are not going to log into a container and patch the operating system. What you'll do is you will go to the place where containers come from and say, make me a new version of that container that contains a patched operating system. And then you get this other immutable thing and you put it in various places so that uh, AWS knows the conditions under which they should start that container somewhere. Um, and that's fine, but it is a full kernel. And it, is, uh, it, can, it can have a shell. Uh, not that you need one necessarily, unless your app might need a shell for what it's doing. Uh, and it will have a fairly long startup time. Um, so if you're trying to go serverless by going to containers, well, you're still going to have a lot of the uh, security weaknesses of the server you're trying to not have anymore, and you will have uh, latency problems. You know, if a request comes in for a service that's going to be answered by some container, um, boy, I'm way over time, but I'm not getting the hook, so that's good. Um, then, you know, you, you, then you can live that way, and a lot of people do. But there was a useful middle ground. You know, what if we had a micro VM? that was open source software created by Amazon, but then open to the community, uh, where the hypervisor was very thin and written in Rust, which is a memory safe language. Um, and you could build yourself kind of a, it would be a little bit like a container, except that it starts up almost instantaneously. Uh, the, the stats that we publish are that we could start up to 150 of them per second and the latency between when you know you need one and when it will be answering questions from a customer is as low as an eighth of a second, 125 milliseconds. Um, that makes serverless uh, approachable. It, it raises the utility by dropping the cost. And uh, that then gives you a lot of the benefits of Lambda. In fact, Lambda and Firecracker uh, work together quite well. And uh, Graviton is ARM, uh, ARM64. So uh, I have, you know, an ARM laptop here, and I can compile things on it that will run on a Graviton. It's the same instruction set, but everybody who takes the ARM package kind of wraps different things around it, uh, and I think that's great. I'm sure Apple put all sorts of cool things into the ARM that's in this laptop. Um, and uh, because they're Apple, I don't need to know what they are. But um, it's uh, 
the things that we put into Graviton in order to sort of have our arm fit our needs uh, were in some cases security related. Um, and as a, one example of this, uh, we have in each uh, package, in, in each core, uh, each chiplet, uh, it has its own cache. There is not a shared cache between the, the whole package and memory. There is just the individual per core cache. And we're not doing hyper-threading. We're not letting more than one operating system run on the same core at the same time. And uh, boy, that gets rid of a whole class of possible side channel bugs. Um, and you know, I'm not going to recount those, but I'll just say you've all had a chance to learn what happens if you put two different pieces of software on, uh, in the same cache. Uh, now, it's got other things that are pretty good. Uh, for example, the memory encryption is always on. And so if there were a way to break through Nitro to the point where you could get to physical memory and copy it out, it would be garbage to you. And we're not the only, this is not the only CPU who has it, uh, but we have it and we consider it vital. And the key that is used to encrypt memory is generated during the uh, power on cycle and therefore it's ephemeral, it disappears when you power it off and there isn't an instruction by which that key can be retrieved. So if you could get close enough, and again, let's say you broke into the Nitro hypervisor so that you could run on the physical CPU, there just isn't a data path from the memory encryption key to you. And um, that's the best way, in my opinion, I wasn't asked, this all happened before I got here, but I would have said that is the best way to prevent exfiltration of that key is that there is no data path. It would be called an air gap, but this is an airless environment. So um, what, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is just that we have a cache on every one of those little cores. Uh, and then the memory is encrypted. And uh, it probably, all it sees on that PCI in our environment would be the Nitro stuff that is offered to it. But, um, you know, you've been around AWS long enough to know about the shared responsibility model. Uh, this is the AWS side of it. And we're trying to get the cloud that uh, workloads are coming into to be secure. Um, and then separately, uh, the workload has its own security agenda. And um, you know, this, this has been startlingly effective. Uh, and it's evolved out of early experiences. You know, we can't imagine that the uh, first cloud-based product that Amazon ever announced uh, was in light of this knowledge. Rather, you'll see that sometime in the last 20 years, we have gradually evolved this knowledge. And this is what drove the design of Firecracker, Nitro, uh, and Graviton3. Um, so it comes together very nicely. I am way more comfortable with the idea of putting my own workloads into this cloud now that I understand these three things. And that's just me kind of being an outsider. I was never a customer before I came here. Thank you so much, Paul. I'm sure you have questions for him, but let's hold the questions for the networking session. Uh, thank you so much for coming here, Paul, and um, giving us your talk. Thank you.